The Google business plan is the greatest threat to freedom on the internet, greater than the NSA, greater than any censor, because it's directly making money from controlling what people know about. And, and that is a, a huge problem. Voormalig Atari-medewerker Jaron Lanier is schrijver, computerwetenschapper en bedenker van de term virtual reality. Hij vertelt in het komend kwartier over hoe big data gebruikt wordt om onze vrijheid te beperken. Welkom bij Tegenlicht Talks. Well, for me, it was all based on results. I mean, uh, I saw several kinds of results in the world that simply were, were disappointing, were completely the opposite of what I expected. Um, one of them was the increase in wealth disparity. I mean, around the turn of the century, we started to see the middle classes all over the developed world suffer. And as the centuries progressed, we're seeing it get worse and worse. We're seeing recoveries that don't have jobs. You know, we're seeing uh, this wealth concentration all over the world. We're seeing austerity in Europe. Mm -hmm. We're seeing uh, austerity everywhere. And to my mind, uh, there, there, there are multiple explanations. And I'm not saying this is the only explanation. But at the very least, the internet is not helping. And it's probably hurting. It seems to me to be hurting. And the reason I say that is the specific industries that have been most affected by the, the internet, the, the media industries, journalism and music and all, we have not seen this explosion of wealth for these people. Instead, we've seen this frenetic um, sort of seeking of attention, seeking of fame, but the actual results for people are that there are fewer people making a living. And, and, and we, we wanted so much to believe that we were creating new opportunities, that we still fantasize that we see these huge classes of people who are doing well, but when you really look, they don't exist. We're kidding ourselves, we're lying to ourselves. And, and, and that, I, the one thing I cannot tolerate is lying to myself. This is something that we should never accept. And so we have to look at the reality and say, wow, you know, this idea was, it, it was a good idea that we had for good reasons, but it's failed the test of reality. It actually doesn't work. Well, the data we produce is a very strange object. It's an object that, <laughs> you know, one of the ideas about capitalism, about markets, is that uh, there's a single thing that you sell and that whoever bids on it can buy it uh, and, and in a very open marketplace all kinds of different people might be able to buy it. But with information it's very different. Information is very valuable but only to certain people who were designated able to buy and sell it and then to other people they're just excluded and it's worthless and particularly the people who produce the information. So it's a it's an exception to the practice of markets and it's a, it's a very weird thing. So uh, your information in some technical sense depending on what country uh, your information might be owned by you but you don't have the power of ownership. You don't have the power to decide not to sell it. You don't have the power to set your own price. You have no power at all. You're, because the problem is that you have to click through on these agreements, or maybe you're just observed. Now, so the, but then there are third parties who aggregate the information and analyze you. Those parties control your information. Whether they own it technically is a different question, but they control your information. And there's, there, there, there are several kinds of parties that control your information. They're government entities, like, like the NSA, very famously, but the NSA is not the only one. It's all the countries. Um, there are the consumer-oriented companies, like the Googles and the Facebooks. Mm -hmm. But the most important ones, the very most important ones, are the financial and services companies, the banks, the insurance companies. These are the ones who really influence you the most, and they're doing exactly the same thing. They're gathering your data and analyzing it in order to make decisions about your life, you know. And, and it is that final process that creates austerity. It's, it, this, is, this is the really important one that people don't focus on. Let's talk first about this idea of advertising. Now, advertising <clears throat> used to be a form of rhetoric, a form of expression. 
So an advertisement meant there's a beautiful woman with a beautiful car, and mm -hmm. if you buy the car, you'll be around the beautiful woman. It, it was always bullshit. Everybody knew that. And yet somehow we bought into it. And my personal opinion is that this type of advertising, even though it's ridiculous and annoying in many cases, has been essential to our well-being because um, people are habit bound and modernity has required people to change habits and advertising has been the way that we've done that and I think that's mostly been for the better so overall I, I'm, I'm um, happy with traditional advertising I'm glad it exists mm -hmm. however what we're talking about in the internet era is not advertising as we knew it instead what this is about is micromanagement of the options in front of you and so it's really not behavior modification but behavior restriction so what, there's only a limited amount of, of screen space. There are only a limited number of seconds with which you can look at any device you have, your phone or tablet or whatever. And so if Google or Facebook can say, OK, here you see this option, that is not just a question of influence. It's not just a question of suggestion. It's not just a question of, of um, making something available to you you wouldn't have known about. It's actually uh, restricting your options within a very narrow scope. It, it, so it's, it's a very important distinction. Google is not an advertising company because what they, what they, they make 95% of their money, essentially everything, not from advertising that has any sense of style or any sense of persuasion. It's simply from micromanaging the limited number of options in front of you. Mm -hmm. So it's more a behavioral option management company. And, and I think there's something insidious about the very idea. Um, and, and I have to say that this idea of the open internet, the idea that it's it, just in order for information to be free, we'll let advertising be the business plan, it, that trade-off is terrible because what it means is that instead of exploring options, instead of being free to walk anywhere you want in the city of the internet, you're, there's, there are these people who are steering you and they're putting up blinders so you can only see certain streets because there's a limitation to how much you can see ultimately. And so if you're micromanaging which options are available, you're essentially directing people. So the Google business plan is the greatest threat to freedom on the internet, greater than the NSA, greater than any censor because it's directly making money from controlling what people know about. And, and that is a, a huge problem. Big data in itself as a tool can be tremendously valuable. Uh, if a city can look at information about how everybody's moving around, they can make better decisions about where to put a new hospital or how to design the streets. Th that's good. Big data in itself is not the problem. It's the misuse of big data. And this is always a very difficult idea for me to get across because people tend to think in oppositions, either you're pro-technology mm -hmm. or anti-technology. Yeah. And so they'll say, oh, well, you must be anti-technology. You've turned against technology. That's not true. I'm very pro-technology. I'm very pro-big data. I work on big data all the time. <laughs> I think it's fantastic. It's an amazing tool. Yeah. I, I think the, the right way to think about it is commercially. And, uh, you know, there, there are many ways we, one could approach this problem of, you know, how do you decide when, when data is being well used and when it's being badly used. Um, so l let us look at our options. We could say uh, we should do it in terms of human rights, and we should say people have a right to privacy or people have a right to make decisions. Those are both problematic because, well, privacy is in a way a useless idea because if you say I want to hold on to my data and keep it private, then you're not participating in the benefits of big data. Uh, if you want to say, you can use my data, but it's anonymized, you're still not participating in the benefits. And besides, anonymization is impossible, so it's stupid. But um, so privacy doesn't mean anything. In a sense, it's, a, it's not a useful idea. And it's, it's the idea that's driving government bureaucracies who look at this, except it doesn't make any sense, so they're all wasting their time. Mm -hmm. You know, and this, I don't know, I, I don't know what to do with this. I, I just w listen to privacy bureaucrats and I just can't believe I'm listening to people talk about absolute nonsense, which they can't define and can't do anything about. So, so th th what I prefer, <clears throat> instead of privacy, is I prefer to think about commercial rights. Because commercial rights are a form of privacy. If you, if you, uh, have, if you live in a place that, that's defined commercially, you have a rental agreement or you own the place, and that creates privacy. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a way of talking about privacy that's much more concrete, where you can be very specific. You don't have to rely on philosophy. You can actually concretely talk about something. 
So what I believe is that people should own their data, they should be paid for it, and they should have rights to make decisions about the price of their data. And I think that that very simple idea would actually solve a lot of problems that are otherwise almost impossible to think about. It's interesting that the greatest fortunes in history are being built almost interest, almost instantly uh, on peop other people's data. And yet it's very hard to say how much the data is worth. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. It's a very interesting situation. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, so um, how can we figure out how much the data is worth? There are a few ways. One way is we can look at what third parties are willing to pay each other for your data. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to get that information because even though the companies that want your data promote what they call openness, Facebook says, share, share, you have to share. Um, even though they want that, the truth is that their own operations they keep very secret. So it's very hard to know how much people have paid each other for access to your data. Mm -hmm. We don't know the total amount. We do know that it's substantial, though. We do know that the market values companies that collect data. So based on just looking at all of that, we can estimate that perhaps for an average person, some hundreds of dollars have been spent for access to their data in a given year. Um, for a lot of people, it's actually in the thousands. But there's probably nobody for whom it's less than the hundreds at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a certain amount of money. But then there are other systems that you can look at directly where you can get information. I know the, the executives at Google more than the ones at Facebook, although I know, I know some of those as well. Mm -hmm. um, they're very sweet people for the most part. I think we're very lucky with the young people in Silicon Valley. I think they're good-natured people for the most part. But that's not the point. I mean, you can't always count on a good king, right? And that's the problem. The problem with having a country based on royalty is that sometimes there can be a bad king. <laughs> and so uh, the problem with Google and Facebook is not so much that I think there's anything wrong with the people there. Mm -hmm. It's that um, today their hand can be forced by the NSA. Mm -hmm. Nobody in Silicon Valley wanted to do what the NSA wanted, but they were required to by law and in secret, and you know, utterly in secret. They can't even talk about what happened. So uh, and then, but furthermore, who's going to inherit it? L think about Facebook. Facebook is a large public company owned and controlled by one person. That in itself is very strange and exceptional in the history of, of corporations, right? But that, that person is, is not going to be immortal. So it'll be inherited by somebody. And who? It could be, it could be all kinds of people. So there's a danger um, that, that these, these companies will be forced, their hands will be forced in the moment or <coughs> through inheritance. But totally aside from that, even with the best intentions, these companies are destroying the economy. Well, if we continue to do what we're doing, very gradually, we'll create a plutocracy where there are certain people who are close to the big computers that model the behavior of everyone else. They'll become richer and richer and more and more powerful. Everyone else will have cheaper services, but will also have less income and will gradually become a sort of a large, sort of unnecessary class of people in an era of a very high degree of automation and efficiency because technology will become much better. If you upload a document in Dutch and get it back in English uh, to, to a server somewhere, it might seem like there's some automatic electronic brain that's doing the work, but this is not so. What's actually doing the work is uh, many real translations by real human translators have been gathered and then statistically correlated with the input example. So it's big data doing the job. So little phrases are similar to pr other phrases that were translated before. Mm -hmm. You create a mashup of all of those previous examples, <clears throat> and that's your translation. So the thing is, it's not an electronic brain. It's real people behind a curtain, and we pretend they don't exist. We don't pay them, and that way, whoever does the translation can gather data in exchange and become more and more powerful and more and more rich. But the problem with that is that not only is it unfair to those people who did the real work, who provided the big data, it also destroys economic growth because by pretending that that value was never created in the first place, you're cutting off the books the value of information. And in the information age, that is the economy. The better technology gets, the more information is the value. And so at that point, what you're doing is you're destroying economic growth artificially just in order to concentrate power for the few companies that can get away with creating that illusion. If we did complete accounting, 
so that we were actually keeping track of the total value, we'd see more economic growth. This would be good for the big companies as well as for individuals. This is the way to have a healthy economy even when the machines get very, very good. It's good for democracy and it's good for markets.